This week we've got a jam-packed episode covering everything from the upcoming Ubuntu LTS release to some great news for NVIDIA users, and Gen 2 is making some big changes to the structure of the project. All of this and so much more on this episode of This Week in Linux, your source for Linux good news. This episode of Twill is sponsored by Linbit. More on them later. The beta release for the upcoming LTS or long-term support version of Ubuntu is available now. So Ubuntu 24.04 Noble Numbat beta is available. Now this beta is also only a couple of weeks away from the final release, so if you wanna wait for that, that's an option too. But this was because it was delayed due to security fixes that were needed after the revelation of the XZ backdoor. If you want to learn more information about the XZ backdoor security issue, you can check out last week's episode, Twill 258, to learn more. So we're going to be touching on just a few things here and there, the highlights of this release, because we're going to go into much more detail when the final release comes out in a couple of weeks. So first, be sure to subscribe to get all the information. But now let's talk about the highlights. So the latest GNOME desktop of GNOME 46 is going to be included, which brings many features like collapsible notifications, and a reorganized settings app, as well as many more. Ubuntu 24.04 is coming with Linux kernel 6.8, updated Mesa drivers, and also getting updates to the compiler for GCC 13 for a smoother and faster experience. Now, a really big thing for laptop users is that you can now expect longer battery life. I know everybody's thinking, absolutely, thank you, and this is because of the power efficiency improvements that have made for this particular release. Now, there are many improvements to the installer, such as being more accessible, which is awesome. That is fantastic to hear. And also, they're offering new customization options in the installer. And Ubuntu 24.04 includes a special tweak along with the newest Mesa drivers for improved gaming performance. Now, what is that tweak? Well, a user or suggestion was submitted to Ubuntu and the Ubuntu developers have massively increased the distro's virtual memory mapping limit. Now, the interesting thing is that this massive increase was also a very small change that was, should have a big impact on gaming performance in Ubuntu because some titles previously reported to crash or show performance issues on Ubuntu due to its VM max map output or max map count value being too low and would not work. Now, the current versions of Ubuntu set the max, the VM max mount count to 65,530. And so some games that was considered too low. So in Ubuntu 24.04 LTS, the value has been raised to 1,048,576. Now this same value is used both in Fedora and Pop! OS. And just this week, Arch Linux also made this change for the VM max map count value. Yes, rolls right off the tongue. There's also underscores in between each of those words, so there's that. Now, Ubuntu 24.04 includes a significant library transition to address the year 2038 problem. Now, this is an interesting thing for those who have not heard of it. It is very similar to the Y2K problem, except that it is a much longer from now and also much more problematic because it applies to a larger scale issue. Now, this has mostly been corrected and there's still a few things to address, but uh, for the vast majority of things, there already have been put into places, uh, changes to uh, address this, but there are still more things to do as well as that's why it's included in this latest version of Ubuntu 24.04. For those who are curious, the issue is basically the time referencing of the Unix time, which is basically numbers that counted since a specific time, which is in 1970. And this is an issue because once this overflow is hit, it would then tell the systems that it was 1901, which would not work out very well, as you might imagine. So, a lot of stuff is being done to fix this. And one of the things is to take it from the existing um, signing of the 32-bit integer where it's where the time information is stored to a 64-bit integer. Now, what, what this will do is change that uh, deadline from 2038 to 292 billion years from now, which is good, right? 
I mean, that's 285 billion years after the sun destroys the planet. So we should be good to go at that point. Also, real quick, there's an important note is that I mentioned earlier, this is a beta. So it's not recommended for uh, everyday use on your main machine just yet. If you're one of the people who want to use it for your production machine, you can wait a couple weeks and let it, you know, get done to be final release. But if you want to try it out, submit some bug reports and that sort of thing and just test the overall experience ahead of time, you can do that by downloading this beta. Now, this is only a small fraction of the stuff that you can look forward to in the next Ubuntu LTS release. So be sure to subscribe to get to the full list when the final version comes out in a couple of weeks. Two weeks ago, Gen 2 Linux celebrated 22 years of the project. So happy somewhat belated birthday to the Gen 2 team. Also, Gen 2 has been making a lot of interesting changes as of late with the big news of introducing binaries to the project, which we'll, well, we covered that on episode 250 of Twill. But this week, Gen 2 announced something pretty shocking. Gen 2 has become SPIware. I know, right? That, that term. So for those unfamiliar with SPI, SPI stands for Software in the Public Interest and is a nonprofit corporation registered in the state of New York. It was founded to act as a fiscal uh, sponsor for organizations that develop open source software and hardware. Essentially, their mission is to help open source projects by handling their non-technical administrative tasks so that they aren't required to operate their own legal entity to have the project. Now, Gentoo is joining many, many other projects associating with SPI. Projects already working with SPI include LibreOffice, FFmpeg, Xorg, Systemd, Arch Linux, and Debian Linux. Well, Debian was the reason why the SPI organization was started in the first place, actually. So there you go. Why would a project like Gentoo want to do this, you might be asking? Well, this allows for Gentoo developers to do what they want to do. Develop. Develop Gentoo. And SPI does a lot of other stuff. So here are some services. Now, not every project is going to use every service, but this is what the SPI organization offers. Accepting donations and holding funds, uh, pay for project expenses, holding substantial and intangible assets, signing contracts, accounting and auditing, as well as legal assistance. And now there's a lot of cool stuff that they offer. The accounting and auditing is very important. The signing contracts is really cool because if a project wants to be involved in something and a contract is involved, then they can have the organization review all of the stuff for them and sign it for them to make sure that it is good. So that is fantastic as a, a service that they offer for these projects. But let's talk about that donation thing because this is a little more complicated I wanted to talk about. A lot of people just say like, oh, why don't you just accept donations? It's not that simple. In fact, that donation thing is a, a bit more complicated and it's because once a project starts collecting donations, they have to start dealing with taxes on those donations. And for people who just want to develop, it can be a burden to accept donations. This is why there are so many projects that just don't want to collect donations because it's more of a headache than what it's worth dealing with, right? So SPI makes accepting donations much, much easier for the projects, but also adds a bonus for the donators. For example, if you're in the United States, you can get a tax deduction for these donations since SPI is a 501c3 organization, which is pretty awesome. And I think this is great news and more projects should consider this kind of structure because it will help them in a lot of ways. Maybe even introduce more donations to the project since those donations can be tax deductions for some. Now, SBI isn't the only organization that offer these kinds of services to open source projects, but they have been around since 1997, so it's a, probably a solid choice. So once again, happy birthday to Gen2 and congrats on becoming SPIware. I know you probably don't want to call your associated projects SPIware, but it's just, it's right there. It's, it's, it's right there. How could I not do that? For all the NVIDIA users out there wondering what the future holds for you when Wayland becomes the only options for desktop users, well, that concern is almost a thing of the past. There's a lot of reports around something called Explicit Sync and how it's going to bring solid Wayland support for NVIDIA users, and this is getting a lot of positive attention. So people are now asking, is this too good to be true, though? Well, let's talk about it. First of all, no, it's not too good to be true, but let's talk about why. So what is Explicit Sync? Before we get into those details, let's talk about what it's replacing, which is Implicit Sync. So this is means that kernels 
uh, and the user space drivers look at the commands the application is sending to the GPU and check which pre uh, previous tasks have been completed before it and potentially make the application wait until the dependencies of the commands it wants to execute are resolved. Now, explicit sync flips that so the control is on the application end. So the application explicitly tells the relevant components when rendering is complete and what tasks to synchronize to in the first place using various synchronization primitives. So explicit sync is used in Vulkan and Wayland protocol specifically is used internally by OpenGL and Vulkan drivers to synchronize with the Wayland compositors. Now this explicit way of synchronizing GPU commands helps avoid accidental synchronizations and it also helps improve performance by reducing the work drivers have to do. Instead of having to figure out the dependencies of tasks, the apps just tell them directly what to do. And friend of the show and KD developer Xavier Hugel, or as I know him as Zamunda, recently made a blog post about this topic, and in that he said, with the explicit sync protocol being implemented in compositors and very soon in x Wayland, and the proprietary NVIDIA driver, all those problems will finally be a thing of the past, and the biggest remaining blocker for NVIDIA users to switch to Wayland will be gone. Now, this is fantastic news because it means the, con the concerns that NVIDIA users are having with the transition to Wayland are soon not going to be a problem, and that is awesome. It means that Wayland can get more and more adoption, and that's just fantastic news because the biggest holdout was NVIDIA and NVIDIA users because they had to. Now they're not going to have to, and that's amazing. So if you want more information on this, I'll link to Xavier's blog in, in the show notes so you can explicitly sync up with the data. Yeah, that was bad. <laughs> this episode of Twill is brought to you by Linbit. Linbit has been keeping digital businesses running for over 20 years. They're the makers of open source products like DRBD, which is high availability software that has been part of the Linux kernel since 2010, and Linstore, industry-leading open source software-defined storage. Linbit has an active presence in the open source community as well because they collaborate with the community to help identify and build new features to their products. Limbit provides enterprise-grade software that runs on a variety of platforms without vendor lock-in, which is really cool because no matter what your OS is and no matter what kind of hardware you want to use, including off-the-shelf hardware, you're good to go with DRBD and Linstore. And also with DRBD and Linstore, you can have high-speed replicated block storage in almost any configuration, whether it's Kubernetes, Apache Cloud, or Open Nebula. There's even DRBD proxy for long-distance replication. Linbit provides really awesome services like DRBD, and DRBD is a really good way to make sure you have good data recovery and backups. And if you ever have like a cluster with multiple nodes and one of those nodes fa fails, you can have rest assurance that the backup nodes will have the data that you want. So if you're interested in checking out any of the software from Linbit, I highly recommend it. So go to linbit.com to check it out. That's L-I-N-B-I-T dot com. Many Linux gamers have been using the awesome project Lutris to play a game called League of Legends for years now. But Riot Games has decided to break their game for Linux users, and their reason for doing so is to stop cheaters. Now, that's a reasonable reason, but Riot Games is including their Vanguard anti-cheat tool in the game League of Legends, and this is what is stopping Linux gamers from being able to play it. Not that it was easy to do in the first place, but, I mean... Still, at least it was possible. Now it's... So I'm sure you can tell that I'm not a big fan of this decision. But to be fair, cheating on online games is a constant battle for game developers. So I can respect the intent behind this decision to want to stop cheaters. In fact, this is a very good thing because cheaters are losers in life and just ruin games for everyone. But the way they are going about it is, well, lame. And even if it didn't block Linux users... I would still tell people to avoid the game now. We'll get to why I say that in a bit, but first, let's talk about the cheating problem in, in League of Legends. So Riot Games expressed the issue that they are experiencing with cheaters, and it's pretty bad. They stated that as many as 1 in 15 games globally has a scripter or a botter in it. But in some regions, this number is as high as 1 in 5 games, which is problematic, to say the least, so I get it. You want to improve the legitimate gamer experience, and that's good. That's a noble goal. But the way you're going about it, 
Well, that's disappointing. So what is different about this anti-cheat versus the other anti-cheats that do work on Linux? Well, this is a kernel level anti-cheat, which is also known as a terrible solution. So let's talk about what that means and why it's a terrible solution. Kernel level anti-cheat means that the tool has access to everything in your computer, software, and hardware. Now, let's talk about what that means in the terms of malware, because there are types of malware called rootkits. Now, rootkit doesn't necessarily mean it's malware, but a lot of times when people use that term, they are referring to the malware version of it. But these essentially guarantee complete control over a system if the infection is successful. And not all of these rootkits are gonna have kernel level, but still get providing the full control over the computer. But the worst possible kind of these is a kernel level rootkit. Now this, com this gaming company wants you to agree voluntarily to give them kernel level access to your computer. I don't care how well intended they are. I mean, one bad actor at that company could wreck millions of machines if they were able to get access to that kernel level tool. So personally, for me, I would say, no, thank you. And then I would also tell other people the level of what you're giving. And some people say it's a necessary evil. No, it's not. It's a video game. It's not a necessary evil. In fact, it's not necessary in some ways because you have detection already that shows you how many people are using bots and scripts. So if you already have anti-cheat detection, why do you need... This is a long topic. And there are some quotes that I wanted to share with you from Riot Games. But as I was preparing for this topic, I realized that this is kind of a monster of a topic to have in this show. So... I need to kind of have like a dedicated video for this because there's just so much to it. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a video about this particular topic. And that means I'm going to end this topic here for the show with the final note of, I think this is absurd and unnecessary and just a silly thing for Riot Games to do. And that's my opinion. If you want to get my full take on this topic, well, then subscribe to the YouTube channel because that's coming out very soon. In the previous topic about League of Legends, I mentioned that Lutris was used by gamers to play it, but I didn't explain what Lutris is, so let's do that now, since there is a brand new version to talk about this week. Lutris is a video game preservation platform aiming to keep your video game collection up and running for as long as possible. Lutris provides emulators, compatibility layers, and game engine re-implementations needed to run games in the most optimal way often offering an enhanced experience compared to the original platform it was made for. So let's talk about what's new in Lutris 0.5.17. So this release introduces new runners for Vita 3K, a PS Vita emulator, and Supermodel, a Sega Model 3 arcade emulator. But probably the biggest thing to talk about here is the release adds support for UMU, or UMU. I'm not sure if you're supposed to like pronounce it that way or, you know. But this is a unified Linux Wine game launcher, which allows you to properly run Proton outside of Steam. Now, to quote the UMU project, or GitHub, it says, It is essentially a copy of Steam Linux runtime slash Steam runtime tools that Valve uses for Proton, with some modifications made so that it can be used outside of Steam, which other launchers like Lutris and Her Heroic Games Launcher can use. And now this support is experimental inside of Lutris, but it also became the only method of using Proton in this release for Lutris. So that seems pretty promising as an experimental support, you know? So if you're a Linux gamer, then Lutris is a tool that you should certainly have in your inventory. And if you'd like to learn more about it, you'll find a link to Lutris.net in the show notes. The Cody Entertainment Center team have released the latest version of their award-winning cross-platform and open source home theater and media center software with Cody 21. This release is a major upgrade from previous releases with a lot of new features and improvements, so let's just dive in. So Cody 21 brings support for FFmpeg 6.0, NFS version 4 support, support for reading and writing M3U8 playlists. It also adds support for AVIF images, and also audio engine improvements on Linux have been added to this, and as well as support for pass-through formats like DTS-HD and TrueHD on Linux, and many, many more. 
Cody relies significantly on FFmpeg to do a lot of heavy lifting. And we'll be talking more about FFmpeg later in the show, but this is a massive upgrade from the previous release of Cody, so that is awesome to see. Dolby Vision on-the-fly profile conversion is also available, so Android users can now convert some less well-supported DV profile types to more well-supported profiles. Also, macOS now uses native windowing. Not really relevant for the show, but in case you need to use it on Mac, you can now make it look more native. Speaking of native, Kodi can now natively run on LG WebOS TVs thanks to a port made possible by some awesome developers who are reverse engineering huge amounts of the WebOS media pipelines. I'm a big fan of WebOS. I have always been for years. This WebOS is a little bit different. So, you know, it's cool that you can run it on LG WebOS TVs because I actually have one of those. So I am looking forward to running it on this TV to see how it runs and all that kind of thing because I don't really like the WebOS experience that much on the TV. Now, WebOS, when it was made by Palm and it was for phones, that was awesome. This one, uh... Anyway, Cody is a fantastic entertainment center and I've used it on so many different devices and many different platforms over the years and it never ceases to impress. So if you're looking for a solid entertainment center, then go check out Cody.tv to see more for yourself. A new version of FFmpeg has been released and FFmpeg 7.0 brings a lot of big features and updates. For those unfamiliar, FFmpeg is a complete cross-platform solution to record, convert, stream, audio, and video. In fact, FFmpeg is the leading multimedia framework able to decode, encode, transcode, mux, demux, stream, filter, and play pretty much anything. It supports the most obscure ancient formats up to the most cutting edge formats as well. FFmpeg is also a critical component to most of the video and audio tools on Linux. Like I said earlier in the show, Cody uses FFmpeg for a lot of heavy lifting and pretty much every video editor on Linux does as well. So what's new in FFmpeg 7.0? There's a new native VVC decoder that is currently experimental for supporting versatile video coding. Also, there's a new multi-threaded FFmpeg CLI tool, which is really cool because this FFmpeg multi-threading CLI support is their biggest code refactoring in years and has been a huge undertaking for the project. And this is very useful thing because with CPUs and GPUs having so many cores to use now, this could be a massive uptick for performance for basically everything using FFmpeg. FFmpeg 7.0 has also added a DVD-video demuxer, initial support for AO Media IAMF for immersive audio model and formats, a Vulkan renderer for FF Play, and many, many more things. Just real quick, a big thanks to the FFmpeg team for all the work that you do because it's, a, it's an application and a project that it doesn't get a lot of attention because it's an underlying thing that is a lot of stuff is based on top of. And most of the time you're just using the command line. So a lot of times people aren't really aware of it. And I just wanted to point it out there because this is a fantastic project that provides a lot of useful features for a ton of applications. So thanks again. And thank you for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on the show and want to be kept up to date with what's going on in the Linux and open source world, then be sure to subscribe. And of course, remember to like that smash button. If you'd like to support the show and the Tux Digital Network, then consider becoming a patron by going to tuxdigital.com slash membership, where you can get a bunch of cool perks like access to the patron-only sections of our Discord server and much more. You can also support the show by ordering the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt or the This Week in Linux shirt at tuxdigital.com slash store. Plus, while you're there, check out all the other great stuff like hats, mugs, hoodies, stickers, and more at tuxdigital.com slash store. I'll see you next time for another episode of Your Source for Linux Good News. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell. I hope you're doing swell. Be sure to ring that notification bell. And until next time, I bid you farewell.